it was early on Sunday morning, just three days after Jesus was brutally crucified. The women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were confused, suddenly two men in clothes like lightning appeared beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. What did you come looking for today? Maybe like the women at the tomb, you didn't arrive with great expectations. All they had experienced just a couple days earlier didn't allow for high hopes. They saw him die with their own eyes. They were preparing for a funeral, not a miracle. Is that you? Do you feel like it's all too good to be true? Like life's gone dark and you can't see your way out? The good news of Easter is that when Jesus walked out of the tomb, he left the door wide open for you and me. Don't you see? There will be no funerals today. The grave is empty. He is risen. Anything could happen.
thankful for that. It means everything. We live because he lives. Amen. Are you happy today? It is Easter. We, we so welcome you and thank you for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us before we move on with the service. Why don't you step out and shake someone's hand around you and welcome them to church. morning. I see some great connections being made in the room. We are also happy for all the folks who have joined us online. Let's give a hand for all the folks that have joined us online this morning. We would love to know that you're here today, whether you're online or in the room. If you'll take out your phone and use that camera app that you have, you can scan that QR code that is on the seat back in front of you or there on the screen. If you're our guest, we know you could be a lot of places this morning, but we are honored that you have chosen to be a part of the Easter experience here at the assembly. Uh, just select whether you're a guest or a regular tender. Let us know you're here. Let us know who's here with you. And we'll continue to give you great information about all that's going on here at the assembly. We want to continue in our worship with our giving. I want to invite the ushers forward. As the ushers get into place, they're going to start passing the offering buckets, and you can give that way today. And you have a myriad of other ways you can give as well this morning. You can see the digital options that you have there on the screen. We are coming off just a, a series of days that have been amazing around here. And yesterday, we had the big Easter carnival. You guys, it was an amazing day. Our dream team, over 200 of you came out in that cold and that rain, and you made that event happen yesterday, rain or shine, and there were families uh, just coming from all over the place that were enjoying that opportunity to be together. It's right in the vein of our vision and our mission to serve neighbors and nations, and you just knocked it out of the park. We appreciate all the dream team that served. Speaking of kids ministry, though, we've got Allison Wynn with us, our kids pastor, and I wanna give her an opportunity to share what is going on in kids ministry today good morning we are so excited to have all your kids and grandkids in our services today the theme in kids ministry today is the colors of easter and so we're talking all about the gospel message through the use of colors in an age-appropriate way that's super exciting so they are going to go home today with one of these pages and it gives you an outline of what we've learned so you can continue the conversation at home but the fun doesn't stop there because they are also going home with one of these fun, colorful cuche balls. And so it'll be a I great reminder as they play with it of what they've learned today and the gospel message that they've learned. But there's also a huge announcement today. Surge registration launches today. Come on. So if you're not familiar with what Surge is, it is the best of VBS and the best of Kids Camp mashed into three amazing days. So if you have kiddos in your life that are ages four to the fifth grade, you do not want them to miss this. So go online, sign up, it's at the end of June. We do all kinds of things from games to crafts to a stage presentation, and they will love it. You don't want them to miss it, so sign them up. Hey, we are excited about all that's going on in Kids Ministry. Let's give Allison and that team a hand. They are doing a great job discipling these kids. Hey, this is also a special time of year. In two weeks, we're going to be celebrating water baptisms. Uh, this is one of my favorite moments of the year. We have uh, these baptisms several times a year, but this is the one that's most meaningful to me. This is the month so many years ago, right after Easter, that I was baptized. And I just encourage you, if you've never been baptized or you were baptized as an infant and you didn't understand what was going on or you have kids in your family that you haven't led to that decision, this is a great time to tell them the story of Jesus and the resurrection and to give them an opportunity to accept them as your Lord and Savior and then take that next step. So if you are, are taking a life change today, if you are coming back to church today and you say, I really need a fresh start, that water baptism is a symbol of what you're doing today. And I just encourage you, use that sign up sheet. You're gonna have the sign up online there. You're gonna have two weeks to get signed up and then in two weeks, we are gonna celebrate that water baptism together. Also on that same weekend, we fill up these weekends around here. We're going to have a law uh, enforcement appreciation weekend, and we've invited uh, a lot of the Broken Arrow police officers and their families. Uh, 
uh, we're not limiting it just a broken arrow, but you may have some officers either retired or active, and you may want them to be a part of that weekend. So we want you to have an action step as well, in addition to the invitations we've sent. So you're going to have an opportunity to pick up these cards at the info center. So if you know of an officer in the area here and their family, we'd love for them to come that weekend, either Saturday or Sunday, to the service of their choice. And then they can come, and we're going to celebrate them. We're going to pray over them, and then we're going to have an opportunity to celebrate them with a meal right after that service. Well, this is an amazing weekend. Again, we are so glad that you are here. Haven't you enjoyed our creative team and all the worship they've been bringing so far? We're just getting started today. Uh, let's just welcome them as they continue with this special song.
Amen. You may be seated today. Hey, let's thank this worship team. That was so powerful. Those are the kind of songs that they paint a picture. You not only hear it, but you see it. They're at Calvary. I pray that this gathering could be an eye-opening, life-changing experience. Jesus, when he was on the cross, in my opinion, preached the greatest sermon ever. His Sermon on the Mount is lengthy and awesome, but there's something that's on a whole nother level. When dying by crucifixion, just to breathe, the agony that was going through his body as he was nailed to that cross and having to put the pressure on his hands and feet, nailed to that cross just to elevate himself to collect air. And in that agony, he would speak. He would speak seven precise statements. They're short statements. He's using an economy of words because of what he's going through but they're life-changing. A short sermon, but a powerful sermon. On Friday night, we gathered here, and what an awesome time in the presence of God we had. We celebrated what Jesus has done for us in communion, and then we opened up the carnival for all the people who would be working on Saturday. We wanted them to be able to enjoy it with their families on Friday night. As I was out there enjoying it, one of these kids came up to me and he said, Pastor Ron, like your sermon, like you, you preached from the Sunday all the way to the Friday that Jesus died. Like, and he goes, all the way to Friday. He goes, if you'd have started two weeks before he died, we would have never gotten to go to the carnival. It was a different kid who I'd given a, a bag of candy to, and, and the kid was eating one of these pieces of candy and said, oh, this, this is my favorite. And he goes, just pray that I don't get grounded from candy. <laughs> I said, have you ever been grounded from candy? He said, 10 times. <laughs> I got to share this when I was on one of the rides, and it's this boat that swings, and if you get on it, it, may, it doesn't look as much just watching. But you get on it, you will, it will tell you. And, well, and I look over this little girl, and I say, this is going to be the ride of your life. She goes, have you ever been to Silver Dollar City? <laughs> So Jesus, he does not preach a long sermon as he's hanging on the cross. Rejoice with me that Jesus, out of his love and perseverance, would make this first statement. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That his whole purpose was to save us, his people, from their sin. Amen. And that in that moment of intense pain, that's what he's doing. He is forgiving. And the next statement is in response to the thief who said, will you remember me? A thief who's having an eye-opening moment that Jesus is in fact the Messiah and this thief is in fact in a desperate place as it relates to his future, his eternity. And he says, will you remember me? And Jesus' second point of that sermon, he says, today you will be with me. This guy's not gonna have a day to honor God with his life. He doesn't have hours to honor God with his life. Just how amazing is this, great, this grace? Mercy. Mercy 
is so awesome. And so Jesus expresses that and it just reinforces the statement, the scripture that says, whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved, whoever. But looking at this part of the sermon, we can say, whoever, whenever. If you're having an eye-opening moment, that no matter what's happened up to this moment, whoever, whenever, if you call on the name of Jesus, mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burdened soul come on church there my burdened soul found liberty at calvary thank you jesus for the living hope by the resurrection from the dead i want to look at this next statement where he said my god my god why have you forsaken me I won't preach on all seven statements. But this one, it's important to note that when the writers speak, they are letting us know that it's between 12 and 3 o'clock. All of this started at 9 in the morning. But by 12 o'clock, there's an eclipse. It, it, it goes thick darkness in the middle of the day. And the darkness around him is to give emphasis to the moment this is the moment where the holiness of God cannot continue to look upon what is happening. It is in this moment that Jesus is not only dying for us, but he is dying as us. At this moment, he's not just dying for sin, but as sin. all of my sin, past, present, and future. We started our first of four Easter services at four o'clock yesterday, then six, and now this one and the next one. You take that amount of people and think about the number of sins represented by just the people attending these four Easter services past, present, and future, and in that moment. He is taking upon, the, upon himself the pressure, the penalty, the price of every one of those sins. There are eight billion people, basically, uh, we're up to that amount that live in this world, and he, in that moment, was bearing the weight of the sin of eight billion people the sin of everybody that's died, the sin of everyone that is yet to live. In that moment, Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, in that moment, he who knew no sin, the one, the one who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Let it overwhelm you. Let it overtake you. Let it be a fresh reminder of the goodness of God, the grace of God. Why would he do it? That's my cross, not his. I sinned. I fell short. I fall short. I'm the one with the sin nature, not him. That was my cross. But if there was going to be the possibility of reconciliation with God, there had to be a perfect sacrifice. And he was the only one worthy. He was the only one capable. Lamb of God. God so loved the world, the eight billion. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, this son that would be born of a virgin, that would live a sinless life, that would then humble himself, 
Nobody took his life. He gave his life a ransom for many. In these hours, he's paying the price of redemption. He is paying the price for our transgressions. Our punishment is in this moment being placed upon him. He's been wounded by this point for our transgressions. This is how we can stand and say, he has forgiven all of my iniquity. He has healed all my diseases. He has satisfied my life with loving kindness and tender mercies. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you ever question whether or not you are loved, look at the cross. You are loved. That's what drove him to that place of sacrifice. That is the motivation, the reason. And that is why we sing mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there. It's the only a place, it's the only one, it's the only name given. It was multiplied to me. There my burden, that, that burden, the sin burden, that no one else could lift. The sin burden. And Jesus, Jesus stepped into my place and took upon himself my sin and died on a cross that I deserved to pay a price that I could never pay so that he could throw open a door so that whoever, whenever, that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Could you give an Easter praise to a God so gracious? Come on. A God so good, a God so loving, a God so kind. Thank you, Jesus. And then he said, it is finished. Work is done, the price is paid. This battle is over. And then we will move through Saturday to this day, that Sunday, that Sunday morning, where scripture says early that morning, these ladies went to the tomb and they're going just to finish the burial preparation. But when they get there, the stone had been rolled away. When they get there, there's an angel who's making this announcement. Why are you seeking the living, the living among the dead? He, he's not here. Look for yourself. He has risen. See it, see it. Eye-opening moment. See it for yourself. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. The narrative changed in their mind. On their way, their thoughts were no doubt thoughts of, look what death did to Jesus. But on this Easter, I wanna shout it again. When you look into that empty tomb, you are seeing what Jesus did to death. Come on, somebody. Jesus has broken the chains of death. He has broken the chains of sin. He has broken the power of Satan. He's made a show of demons openly. He has triumphed over them by the cross, by the empty tomb. He's the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. Now they go back and they say to the disciples, he, he's not there. And to Peter and John, they take off for the tomb, and when you read John's writings, he's gonna make sure you know he got there first. Because, you know, that's important. And they find the same. The tomb is empty. They go back with this message, and now we come to Luke 24, verse 13, for something to, that has just fascinated me, gripped me for this Easter. Luke 24, verse 13 says, Now that same day, that same Sunday, resurrection day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. 
As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. <laughs> but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, hey, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Their answer, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Jesus answered, what things? <laughs> Let me just paraphrase their answer. They said, they said, speaking of Jesus, they're talking to Jesus. They don't realize it's Jesus. He was so powerful. He was a man of promise. Quoting them, he said, we, we hoped he was the one. They said, what's interesting is that some ladies went early this morning and they, they say that the tomb's empty. And they came back, quoting these guys, they came back to us and told us and our companions that the tomb's empty. And there were some among us that went and they came back and said, yes, the tomb is empty. At this point, Jesus starts talking, but they still don't recognize him. Did not Messiah, verse 26, have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, now he preaches a longer sermon. He deserves a long sermon. And so do I. Get comfortable. <laughs> you get home about two. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He's talking about himself, and they don't even recognize that it's Jesus. He starts with Moses. Moses, the writer of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses, who himself is like an Old Testament type of Christ in that Moses was a deliverer of people who were held in captivity. Moses' story as a type and picture of Christ as he gets to the Red Sea and there's no way, but suddenly there is a way where there was no way and Jesus, no doubt, is telling these guys, you know, that what you've just seen, that's the way being made. As the Red Sea parted, that cross was making a way where there was no way. And for people to come in, to come through the opening, to come through the open door. And just as the Red Sea collapsed on the enemy, so at the cross, hallelujah, domination was being taken from the enemy. And, and the cross was the closing of the Red Sea. Like it closed on the enemy, it was the disarming of Satan and demons and all of the powers of hell so that my people who come through could praise the one who made a way, could praise the one where there, there is no other name, there is no other hope, there is no other door. He is the door. He then says, he not only spoke of Moses, but the prophets, certainly he would talk to them that Zechariah said, chapter 11, that God, God would be sold for 30 pieces of silver and it would be used to purchase a potter's field. This is Old Testament. And the precision of these prophecies, if anybody ever tries to, to undermine Christianity, it takes way more faith to not believe it because of the precision of prophecy and the fulfillment of that in Jesus Christ, who in time and space and place lived and died and rose again. And there are eyewitnesses to that occasion. And so Jesus speaks of that and no doubt he takes them to Psalm 22 where David prophesied of crucifixion. He talks in detail of what it would be like for someone crucified to even breathe. He talks about what they would go through to try and take in air. And this is 600 years 
before anyone was crucified. David was prophesying something that no one had even thought about. And there on the place of the skull, Golgotha, Jesus hung between two thieves. And that prophecy is coming true and justice and mercy are meeting in the very person of Jesus Christ. No doubt he said to these guys, that's the one wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities. The punishment of your peace was upon him and by his stripes you are healed. What a, what a seven mile journey. Those two guys are getting, as Jesus is talking to them about the scriptures from Moses and the prophets. Verse 28, Luke 24 says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he were going farther. They urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it to give it to them. Verse 31, look at this. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. An eye-opening moment. Let me skip down to verse 32. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we talk, while he talked with us on the road? and open the scripture to us. We have celebrated as the people of God as you hear these words, because you, you understand, you've had your eye-opening moment. For anyone here that has yet to experience the joy of salvation in a relationship with Jesus, let me tell you the way it will happen. There will always be this truth encounter and a power encounter. Truth like Jesus gave to those two men, truth like we have shared with you today from Old to New Testament, this incredible substantive narrative of, of the gospel, and you see all of the prophecies, the priests and the preachers and the prophets and the judges, everything that they did and how they lived, it was all pointing to this person, Jesus. And so at, right now, this truth encounter is happening. But it can't stop there. It can't stop there. It has to start there. But it has to be more than intellectual. This is where the power encounter happens, where your eyes are open. It's called being born of the Spirit. It's called being made new, being made a new creation. It is where the power of grace changes your nature. And then it starts rewriting your story and changing your life. It is so very rational, and yet it's so very personal. It's a truth encounter followed by a power encounter. We know that the spirit, the spirit of the age, I just... Put all my cards on the table. I'm telling you, I believe in a real devil. And, and he orchestrates and strategizes to deceive. And he, he, he moves and maneuvers to blind the minds of people from this truth that I've shared today. But countering that is a greater power than Satan. And it's the power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit illuminating the word of truth so that you see it. And if you're asking today, how will I know that I'm having a truth encounter and a power encounter? Something will start happening in your heart. They, these two guys said it like this. Our hearts were burning. Something starts gripping. Something like maybe a, a knock. Uh, uh, there's just there's an awareness that starts coming to you and it's Jesus and it's, it's Jesus calling and issuing an opportunity for you to be saved Paul 
was even sent. And as he was sent, this is Acts 26, it was to open their eyes so that they could turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and have a place among those sanctified by faith. This is, this is an eye-opening moment. And it happens by truth, and it happens by power. Blaise Pascal, a 17th century scientist who invented the syringe, the first mechanical calculator, and hydraulics. Um, he was an atheist. Until one night, according to his own story, from 10.30 until 12.30 in the morning, he had this revelation. Jesus revealed himself to him. And from that moment, he lived radically for Jesus. And people would challenge him and say, you're brilliant. Surely you don't, you don't believe the Bible. And he would say, in fact, I do. I didn't, but now I do. And he was one of the best to give this eloquent, substantive presentation where it would be like a case for Christ as seen in the scripture. And it would be the, that truth encounter. But then he would say, but it moved beyond information. And for me, it moved beyond intellect. And he said, it became a relationship. That's it. It became a relationship. And they would say, but still, and you know, they, they would challenge the validity. And here's what he said, and it's historic and it's still true to this day. He says, the heart has its reasons which reason knows not. That's this brilliant man saying, on that night, my heart burned within me. And I didn't have to have facts. I had something better than facts. I didn't have to have more information. I had something better than information. The eyes of my heart were being opened. And I saw, and I sensed, and I knew, and I was born again. I was born of the Spirit. My heart was changed. We have prayed that this would be an eye-opening, life-changing moment for you. And quite honestly, we, we get it, don't we? He died on that cross for a purpose. You and I will spend eternity somewhere. And the decision of what we do with Jesus will determine where we spend eternity. Are your eyes opening? Their mercy was great. At the cross, he said, it is finished. The tomb says, look at what he did to death. Now, he opens a door for you. And all you have to do is surrender, submit. Enter this relationship. And the reason I press this, because in a community, in the part of the country where we live and in this community, there's just, you know this truth. It's impossible to, there are churches everywhere. There's, there's so much of the trappings of Christianity. But it's gotta go beyond information. And there are people sitting in this room and Christianity is, is not like meant to be a tradition. And Christianity is not a philosophy. So have, have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Savior? Have you recognized your need for salvation see it's not do you go to church it's not do you come from a family that 
has believed this and lived this. This is about you and your heart. This is about your eternity. This is about your life between now and the time you step from this life. I didn't mention that statement where it says, Jesus said, now, now, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He reminded that what Jesus did allows every Christian to be in the hands of God. And when your life on this earth stops, you go from the hands of God to the hands of God. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord from his hands to his hands. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready for that moment when you step into eternity? That's a very important question. Are you ready for your life to change? When Jesus went to the cross, he disarmed powers and principalities so that addiction doesn't get the final say and it's not the ultimate rule. The power of grace is the authority. You can be free. The, his cross is our freedom. His stripes is our healing. Turn your sin to Jesus today. Turn your pain to Jesus today. Stand with me, everybody. Thank you, Lord. Worship team, come and join me. I'm going to pray, but I just want to, I want to place this song right here, just, just the chorus, a couple times through, and then we're going to pray. Would you sing it with me, team? My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed. interesting physical eyes closed but spiritual eyes are you having an eye opening moment you say pastor ron i am i need to accept christ as my savior in a moment i'm just going to simply ask you to raise your hand and i'm going to lead you in a prayer the truth encounter the power encounter it's happening you sense it in your heart something is saying after today you will never be the same again something has been at work in your life and that's why you are here today things have been lining up in ways and now you see it god has been orchestrating to get you to this sacred moment of crossing that line of faith into his grace you say that's me i need to accept christ as my savior would you lift your hand and I'll see it and I'll pray with you. Anybody across this place, you say, that's me. That's me. That's me. I want to pray this. I want every Christian to repeat it after me. This will encourage those are pray, who are praying this for the first time. Jesus, I open my heart to you. 
I'm desperate for you. I ask you to come into my heart and forgive my sins. Thank you for loving me, dying on a cross, taking my sin so that I could be saved, so that I could be reconciled to God, so that I could have heaven as my eternal home, so that I could have a relationship with you. Thank you for saving me. Now, would you be the Lord of my life? Would you lead me? Continue to change me. I am yours. I repent of my sin. I receive your forgiveness in Jesus' name. And everybody said, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on across this house. You know what I'm talking about. With hands lifted, let's declare it one more time. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. Amen, church? Come on, celebrate your story as you sing. My chains are gone.